Good morning. More turmoil in Ottawa today. You'll remember yesterday that the Prime Minister was being challenged on its memory and his recollection and his integrity on two incidents. One involving the tuna fish and one involving the Tory party. You'll remember that Jerry Lampert of the Conservative Party said publicly that some months ago he told the Prime Minister's office that Marcel Mass, the communications director, was under investigation by the RCMP. And Mr. Moroni said that he hadn't heard about it and he heard it the night before from the Solicitor General and the Commissioner of the RCMP. At his press conference this morning, which started out on free trade, Mr. Moroni, however, has now promised one investigation on the Marcel Mass affair. The question, um, I suppose the question is, did he inform me? The answer is no. Did he, did he, did he, did he inform uh, any member of my senior staff? I'm informed not. And what have I done about it? I have communicated with the, uh, his, uh, his boss, the president of the Progressive Conservative Party, Mr. Peter Elzinga, MP, and asked him to conduct an urgent investigation into this. Elzinga is going to conduct the investigation. There was more turmoil and direct challenges in the House of Commons and question period shortly after that, only an hour ago. Here's what happened. Well, last night, Mr. Speaker, millions of Canadians watched Mr. Lampert confirm that he had indeed told senior members of the Prime Minister's office. I asked the Right Honourable Gentleman Who's lying? The National Director of the Conservative Party or senior members of the Prime Minister's office? It, uh, it, it may be, Mr. Speaker, uh, that uh, neither uh, is. It may be uh, that, uh, as happens from time to time, uh, that one, one does have a problem of um, uh, human uh, error in recollection. I can tell my friend, my red honourable friend wouldn't 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 find wouldn't be astonished by that. It happens um, it happens from time to time in life that uh, uh, these uh, our, our memories are not as uh, fallible uh, or infallible uh, as we as we would like. Uh, I've, I was informed uh, in the manner in which I advise my my red honourable friend. I have no no knowledge uh, of why. Uh, uh, Mr. Lampert uh, made that statement. I am advised that the uh, statement uh, is inaccurate. I have asked the um, president of the party uh, to uh, conduct an urgent uh, review and to report to me. Now, uh, on a totally different level of government, would you like to know the answer to the question, does the public have a right to know what happens behind closed doors? BCTV's John Gibbs tried to challenge that at Vancouver City Council Finance Committee meeting yesterday, and boy, did Harry Rankin, the defender of the faith and democracy and freedom of speech, knock him down. This is over the Vancouver Symphony the Society being in disarray the and the 125,000 promised uh, to them by the council. Now to leave, and uh, we'll discuss afterwards whatever we have to, uh, whatever information that we intend to give you. So if you'd leave now, please, we'll get on with our meeting. Okay. Could you explain why, sir? No. I'm not required to explain why. I'm just required to carry out council's direction. I realize you're not required, but... Goodbye. Is there a problem with discussing the Vancouver Symphony Look, Orchestra in uh, public, sir? I, I'll get a hold of somebody to put you out. I just... Look, we're trying to resolve a problem. Let's be courteous. I think the resolution of council is really clear, and I'd appreciate it if you'd leave. If we have to call security, we will. Couldn't someone explain uh, to the public why this can't be done in public? We're dealing with a sensitive issue which could involve labor relations, which we don't usually discuss in public. And I think that it's, oh, it's in trying to with, all, with all due respect, you, you voted $125,000 to an organization without any public discussion whatsoever. But we did it subject to certain things and subject to this meeting, so that's why we're I would suggest that we end this discussion right now and that he goes. The direction of council is that it's in camera. I don't think there's any point in doing any further discussion. And when we get finished, if there's any statements to be made, we'll make them. So this direction. We're not to know what uh, what goes on with the 125,000. Okay. You're really serious. <laughs> I am indeed. I used to.
to carry out the directions of council views. Thanks. Get the door closing. It's good. Do you have any objection to conducting this meeting in public? Uh, I don't know what the chairman would say. No, but about you, how do you feel, though, sir? That was John Smith going into the meeting, the closed in camera meeting. He's the president of the Vancouver Symphony Society. He's the man whose organization lost $800,000 last year. Remember, the 125,000 was voted in public, but no questions were asked in public at that particular time. And Gibbs and other people like myself would like to know what the council may have found out about the $800,000 loss or the allegations of poor management of the Vancouver Symphony Society. And later at the Vancouver Symphony Society annual meeting, John Smith resigned from the board as president because some people were elected on a slate which he did not approve. He's going to hang around as a director and try to help them get out of this mess if they do. The city council's 125,000 is predicated on money from the feds and the provincial government. But it's unhappy to see Harry Rankin, of all people, closing the doors, even if it was council instructions, to a simple reportorial quest to decide why they're going to give 125,000 or what changes that are in the conditions of the 125,000 they're going perhaps to give from taxpayers' funds to the Vancouver Symphony Society. Oh well, as we move along this morning with our tales of happiness, joy and political amity, we come to two men who are continent-wide experts on free trade with the United States. They are Dr. Richard Lipsy and Murray Smith, both senior advisors to, as they say, the prestigious C.D. Howe Institute. And we'll find out if it's right that free trade can cause mass unemployment in this country and can dilute, if not ruin, our political and cultural sovereignty in relation to the United States. After the break. <laughs> The C.D. Howe Institute does some very impressive and important reports on where Canada's going. The latest one is called Canada's Trade Options. Couldn't be more topical if they'd planned it this way, because the trade option now, it would seem, between Reagan and Mulroney, is free trade or freer trade or sectoral free trade or God knows what not free trade, the fact remains is that we have 1.3 million unemployed in Canada today, 258,000 of them in British Columbia. And I have here Richard G. Lipsy. What's your precise description, your function at the C.D. Howe Institute, Dr. Lipsy? I'm senior policy advisor and I give advice on research into public policy matters and I wrote with Murray Smith, this book you're talking about. And does now. the government ever listen to you? Oh, I believe they do. Uh, they certainly listen. <laughs> Murray G. Smith. Now, what's your title at C.D. Howe? I'm a senior policy analyst at the Institute, and like uh, Professor Lipsy, I give, uh, do research on a wide variety of issues for the Institute. And we agreed the agenda this morning is free trade. Correct. What if, is free trade possible and desirable, or will it kill us? Well, it's certainly possible. Uh, we won't know if it's possible on the terms that are acceptable until we try. We've got to sit down with the Americans, see what kind of a bargain we can bang out, and if we like the bargain, we accept it. If we don't, we'll walk away from the table and be right back where we started with nothing lost. But where does Canada stand today with our shrinking markets and without any, apart from GATT, I don't suppose we have any form of free trade arrangements with anybody? Well, GATT is the principal trade arrangement that we belong to at the present time. But we stand at risk. Uh, Canada is, does not have access to a large market the way in which all the countries in Europe do. And particularly here in British Columbia with this very protectionist climate in the United States, everyone in the forest industry is potentially at risk if some of the legislation that is now before Congress is passed. Can it, the U.S. market could be closed virtually to Canadian lumber exports 
if that legislation is passed. Now, when you said just now, when he said just now, that the, every other Western country has access to uh, free trade markets, are we talking about the European common market? That's right, and the European free trade area. Uh, and then Japan has its own internal market of around 100,000. So we're the only... 100 million. 100 million, sorry. So we're the only industrialized country along with Australia without secure access to the l large enough market to operate uh, industries in today's scale. Oh, how do all of a sudden we find ourselves the trade option, the unwanted, the illegitimate son of world trade? Is that what we are at the moment? Yes. And it has happened because the European countries have integrated themselves, not just the members of the European Common Market, but also some of the other members of the EFTA arrangement. Countries like Sweden, which are not members of the European Common Market, have a free trade association agreement with the European Common Market. And this is the kind of option that Canada is now embarking on to explore whether we could work out a free trade association agreement such as Sweden has with the European community. Well, imagine Sweden, one of the great lumber exporters of the world, has got the whole European market to play with. Right. Yes. Right. And very little competition, I should imagine. Mm -hmm. Where did we fail? Have we been asleep at the switch all these years? No, no. <clears throat> what we've been doing since we entered GATT is slowly reducing our tariff barriers, integrating with more trade in the whole world, but particularly the United States, We've had several rounds of major tariff reductions. After each round, employment has been favorably affected, our exports have been favorably affected, but now the impetus to, for further tariff cuts through the GATT seems to have dissipated. Everybody's interested in erecting non-tariff barriers. They've cut their tariffs down and they're now trying to find other ways to restrict trade. GATT is in danger of coming apart at the seams. And as one of the biggest trading countries in the world, we are at serious risk. That's a change in the situation in the world today. But is this entirely because of the somewhat, I can say as a Canadian, hysterical American protectionist uh, climate? Well, it isn't just America. Europe has become protectionist. Europe has been erecting various non-tariff barriers to trade. The United States is now moving in the direction of trying to erect non-tariff barriers. So yes, we're worried about America because they're our biggest trading partner. But the whole world is entering a phase not unlike the 1930s, where we're in danger of dismantling the arrangements that allow small countries to trade successfully in the world. And that's the risk of Canada, and it's a really serious risk. How bad would you paint the picture of that risk? Well, the risk of protectionist actions in the United States right now is extremely serious. Probably more serious than any time since the Tariff Act of 1930 called Smoot-Hawley. Uh, the climate in Washington is intense. There's intense pressures on Congress to deal with the problems of their constituents, whether it's steel, whether it's lumber, whether it's the whole manufacturing sector in the United States. In very intense pressures for them to address the problems of those particular constituencies. And they're not going to scrap GATT. What they'll do is use some other device like excise tax or unfair competition mm. to keep us out. Am I <coughs> That's correct? That's right. Unfair competition. The, the famous countervail duties are one of the biggest tools they have. If they can establish that a foreigner exporting to the United States is doing so with an aid of a subsidy, they can put a countervail duty to the extent of that subsidy. Now the key thing about that is they don't have to look to whether they're subsidizing. If we subsidize hogs, they can put a duty on us, independent of the fact that they're also subsidizing hogs. One of the things we can hope to get out of a free trade area is the argument that those countervail duties should take account of American subsidies so that they would only countervail if there was a net difference between what we do and what they do. That would be a big step forward. And as we're looking at the climate in the United <laughs> States just now, despite the remarks we may make about them, we're relying on Reagan's own um, campaign for free trade to save us from Congress and the Senate. Well, if you go to some of the key members in Congress, the members of the committees, they are in principle for free trade. And it isn't just Reagan. There is a major move for free trade. Uh, it's been worsened by the temporary difficulties in the states, but there is a lot of support. America has been the major support since the war 
for a movement in the direction of free trade. So we trade. mustn't look on them as baddies in this? Well, we should look at them as people under very serious pressures that we understand, but people who in principle would like to help. And we're not the big threat that Europe and Japan is, so that an agreement with us is much more likely than an agreement through GATT where they've got to come to terms with the Europeans and the Japanese. A bilateral arrangement would be much easier to work out than it ever would be to work out multilaterally. More with Dr. Lipsy and <laughs> Murray Smith after the break. I know my guests from the C.D. Howe Institute would like to be positive, but I had the leader, the Premier of Ontario, and one has never seen nervous Premiers of Ontario before that also <laughs> bleeding smug and fat and comfortable, predict 850,000 unemployed in Canada if free trade comes. That was last night on the CTV News. What is, is he full <laughs> of holes? With due respect, I couldn't possibly accept that. The figures that are being used, that's a gross exaggeration, but the figures being used are for gross loss of jobs. There will be adjustment. There's going to be adjustment in the Canadian economy anyway, and certain jobs have no future. What we must do is to replace them with jobs that have a future, jobs which can, of industries which can stand on their own feet selling in a large market. Now, the best estimates that have been made, and there have been some careful estimates, are that there will be a net increase in jobs, not a decrease. But they won't all be in the same places, and movement will be needed, and we'll have to assist movement. But the best estimates tell us we will actually increase jobs. And the main reason is getting preferential access to the U.S. market. Because we will get into the U.S. market tariff-free, whereas Europe and Japan and others will, of course, still be subject to tariffs. If the negotiations are successful, let's be positive. How could the negotiations shape up? The ne negotiations are going to shape up according to the objectives of the two countries. What Canada wants is to get greater security of access into the U.S. market, particularly r limiting the application of countervailing duties to our exports. We want to reduce U.S. tariffs, and we want to get a system of dispute settlement so that we can't be subject to these kinds of case-by-case -case pressures where our individual industries are held hostage to Congress. Now, what the United States wants is they want to negotiate about investment issues, they want to negotiate about services, and they want to reduce the higher Canadian tariff. The Canadian tariffs are higher than U.S. tariffs, and that's a negotiating chip that we have. And that's, in a nutshell, the broad framework of the negotiations. Well, let's look at the balance of industries. We in the West, of course, we'd love. I could see Bennett salivating last <laughs> night at the prospect of totally free access, especially with the new dollar position. But what about the industries? I mean, it means, does it not, that all U.S. branch plants would close down? No, absolutely not. Uh, there will be some that are solely directed to the Canadian market and nothing else, and some of them will close down. But many of them have what are called product mandates, where they produce a subsector of the company's products, a subpart, which are then sold to the whole world. They won't close down. There's no reason for them to. They already have great capital investment in Canada. They've got a built-up labor force. And indeed, the mass exodus of U.S. Uh, branch plants will not happen. What will happen is we'll lose some that are small outfits solely directed at the Canadian market. What about the auto pack? The auto pact would be, uh, the existing arrangements uh, serve Canada well, and I expect that Canada's position going into the negotiations would be to maintain the existing arrangements for the auto pact. I would expect that that uh, position would succeed, that the provisions of the auto pact are very similar to the provisions that would work in a free trade area. Essentially, you have to reach a value-added level in North America to qualify for duty-free access between the two countries. The only difference is there's a special insurance provision in the auto pact for the level of value-added in the Canadian industry. I expect that Canada would wish to retain that. You see, you worry me when you say uh, that 850,000 figure is kind of ludicrous. But it would be hundreds of thousands of... How many jobs are we going to lose in the normal course of events anyway these days? Well, that's... You see, one of the things people forget is that... Don't the, want to face it. No, but the typical industry has continual 
loss of particular firms growing in new firms. The typical Canadian firm, about a third of the firms, sorry, typical Canadian industry, about a third of the firms disappear in the course of a decade anyway. And then new firms replace them. So there's a continual loss of old jobs and replacement of new jobs. And suddenly, people are looking at that process that goes on anyway and trying to blame it on free trade. It's a process that will occur anyway. Let me say just one other thing. The business community has been very vocal in saying Great adjustments have got to take place in any case. We're under continual pressure from the newly industrializing countries. We've got to adjust to that pressure. The best way to adjust to it is in the context of an expanding market. Free trade with the United States will expand our sales greatly, and it'll be easier to make the adjustments out of those industries where we can't compete in the long run into those industries that can. Hey, might it be that we'd give up high-paying, old-fashioned, old-technique jobs for new-paying, uh, low-paid clone jobs in automated <coughs> industries? Well, only insofar as that's going to happen anyway. There's no reason why just a little more trade with the United States would make a difference to that. Uh, those are pros things that are going on in any case. I want to quote to you something Prime Minister Mulroney said during the leadership convention when he won it. <coughs> Don't talk to me about free trade. Free trade is a danger to our sovereignty. That issue was decided in 1911. You will hear none of it from me now during this leadership campaign or at any time in the future. Well, you know, one of the things that impresses me is most people who are concerned Canadians start being very worried about this, and I don't blame them. I was worried about it. But most people who spend a lot of time studying the issue, which we did for a year, which Donald MacDonald did, which Kelleher did, come to the conclusion, sometimes reluctantly, that it's the only game in town. It's the only way we've got to get the economy back on its feet and to where we want it to be in the year 2000. And I think Mulroney has gone through a learning exercise just in the same way that Donald MacDonald, utterly opposed to it 10 years ago. Yeah, Donald MacDonald was one of the great Canadian nationalists, right. along with Walter Gordon, right. wasn't he? That's right. And he has come to the conclusion, on studying it the way we did, that this turns out to be the only really hopeful game in town. And it's an education process when you study it. If you just stand back and shout doom and gloom and never look at the facts and never say, where will we go if we don't have the free trade area? What's the alternative policy? If you just shout doom and gloom, you can do that forever. Well, um, speaking <coughs> on the emotional aspect, though, free trade is a danger to our sovereignty. And another big Tory said, free Eddie Goodman, fast Eddie Goodman. Even people in the West know fast Eddie Goodman. Much better known out here than Dalton Camp. Free trade would mean political Harry carry. All the key decisions about our future will be made in the United States. That is the situation at the present time. When we have this situation that individual industries, whether it's steel, whether it's lumber, where these industries can be held hostage by U.S. Congress, by U.S. trade legislation, we're subject to very intense pressures. The advantage of going for a comprehensive agreement is that we try and negotiate a set of rules of the road to govern our trade with the United States. The problem for Canada is that the GATT rules of the road are no longer serving us as well as they used to. We want to get stricter rules of the road to govern our trade with the United States. If the Americans turn awkward, have we any clout we can use against? In the negotiations? Yeah. Or? I mean, if they say, no, the hell with free trade, we're just going <coughs> to bring in counterfailing duties, additional excise taxes. Do we have any real clout, despite the fact that we're their biggest uh, export to the biggest, the biggest customer. Yes. <clears throat> well, the biggest cloud I think we have is that they want, in the longer run, progress towards freer trade in the world. And they stated in the President's Economic Report last year that the best way to put pressure on the Europeans and the Japanese, who they see as the big opponents, is to form some regional blocks to show to them that there's still an impetus behind free trade. They want this, this as a test case to show to the rest of the world, and that guarantees us that they won't walk away frivolously. Maybe we won't be able to find an agreement, but they would like to find one as much as we would. Do you remember when Trudeau was giving us all a double talk about decreasing our dependence on the United States and increasing mm. our trade with Europe? Mm. Was that garbage? Well, the Canadian government launched the Third Option Initiative in the early 1970s. That was it, the Third Option. And the objective of the Third Option was to try and increase our trade with the European community and reduce our dependence 
on, on the U.S. market. The way that they sought to increase our trade with the European community was to have state-to-state -state arrangements, a contractual link it was called. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that Canada would cooperate with European countries in uh, defense projects, uh, procurement, etc. That was an incredible failure. Virtually nothing came of it. There was 10 years of meetings between the two countries, between Canada and the European community, and they met every year, but nothing happened in terms of trade, in terms of jobs. Uh, and in fact, over that period, we have become much more dependent on the U.S. market. And yet, at the same time, we haven't taken those steps to give us greater security of access to that U.S. market. If Moroni can pull this off, or if Canada can pull this off, best thing that ever happened to us, post-war years. Yes, I think so. And just one thing about the rest of the world. We'll never be able to sell to the expanding countries of the, the Pacific Rim if our costs are based on the, the high costs of just serving the Canadian market. If we get into the American market, the industries will rationalize, we will achieve costs that will allow us then to exploit the expanding markets in the rest of the world by the end of this century. So I don't see the long run being increased dependence on the U.S. I see us rationalizing Canadian industry, getting our cost to world competitive basis, and then over 20 years' time actually expanding into these other countries. Maybe we'll get back <laughs> down to 5 or 6 percent unemployment. Well, well, certainly the net effect of this over, say, a four-year period would be to increase employment. I don't know if there's any doubt about that. Have you got any questions on free trade to do distinguished experts? It's a tough subject, but try anyway. After the break. Every ordinary person gets confused by all the kind of double talk we normally get from these people. I mean economists. I don't mean you two. <laughs> Uh, but you're going for option five, comprehensive bilateral trade liberalization with the United States. That's right. And no fear of losing our sovereignty. Well, we don't see it. We see, in fact, a, a gain to sovereignty by restricting the current attack on our sovereignty from the United States piecemeal attacks yeah. on our trade. Let's see what people have to say. You go ahead to my two guests. Good morning. Morning. You know, first off, I am 100% in favor of free trade with the U.S., I think that uh, what really bothers me, all these people who are opposed to it, because uh, they say, oh, we all, that the U.S. is going to come in and take us over, and we're going to become like the, the next state of the U.S. and all that. We have the biggest advantage to gain here, because we're going to, the bottom line is we're increasing our market, you know, tenfold. We're getting access to an incredibly huge market, which we otherwise don't have. Have you a question? Well, I just get... Oh, no question, really. Uh, just, I can't understand all these people who are opposed to it. All what right, possible argument can they have? All right. There's always a question in every call. Are there any, what are the bad side effects of free trade which you gentlemen recognize? Well, I suspect one of the concerns that many people mm. voice is that we'll be forced to harmonize all of our domestic policies with those of the United States. Uh, most of those concerns are mistaken. And in fact, there are pressures right now to harmonize our policies with those of the United States. And the, 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 re, the pre way that pressure works is the United States says, this is unfair trade. And they can unilaterally redefine what constitutes unfair trade. And all of a sudden, a practice of Canadian governments that we've had for 20 or 30 or 50 years becomes unfair. And we're, that puts tremendous constraints on our domestic policies. But we just don't see the pressures from a free trade association arrangement on our domestic policies. Look at Sweden and the European community. That's exactly the kind of arrangement that we're proposing. Shouldn't we have been in that? Shouldn't Canada and the States have been in the common market? Could they have been? Could have been. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's a long way back now. It would have been a, a, an interesting proposition. Uh, I, well, you know, it, yeah. we're, it's too hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. It's too so, theoretical. <laughs> too theoretical. <laughs> Theorist over there. <laughs> Am I in the right one? Go ahead, please. No, I'm not in the right one. Hello? Oh, go ahead, yep. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, because um, our uh, labor costs a lot more than the states, that's the reason we have 
uh, increased tariffs. So if we have free trade, are we not going to end up losing more of a market and having an incre like increase of American goods into our country? That, that seems to me what will come with free trade. Well, that's certainly the worry, but the best estimates aren't uh, that that's the case. Now, you see, we're not talking in a vacuum. Canada has been cutting its tariffs in a series of rounds ever since 1947. We had a really big cut in tariffs uh, during and after uh, the Kennedy round, and we're in the middle of one from Tokyo. Now, if you look at what happened after the Kennedy round, indeed, we increased our employment. Some lines disappeared, and other lines expanded, and the net effect was more trade and more employment. So it's happened in the past, and I see no reason why it should be different in the future. Go ahead from Courtney. Yes, Jack. I'd just like to know your views of what would happen if we did get free trade. Uh, do we need unions twice the size they are now? Need unions twice as what? Twice as large as they are now. I'll hang up and listen to your comments. Does that make sense, that question, to you? you know, but what would it do to the role of the unions with free trade? I can't see it would have any effect unless you can see one. Again, if you look at Sweden and the countries of the European free trade area that group around the EC, there has been no pressure on their social, political, and policies such as unions uh, from them. All we're doing is trading goods. You know, we, you can trade goods between us in, within Canada and have some big unions and some small unions. Similarly, we can trade with the U.S. and have big and small unions. So I see no real effect there. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Jack. Um, is it possible that uh, in the negotiations that you were speaking about for this free trade, and you said, what clout does Canada have? Is it possible that uh, the Americans would like to use the uh, Star Wars thing to uh, as a uh, as uh, a club? Yeah, an option like they could uh, they would allow free trade, and then. Then the Canadians okay. would have to... Uh, Let's get an answer to that. Would there be a Star Wars option? Would that be used in negotiation of free trade at all? Is it possible? Remember, the government rejected its policy, but said Canadian businessmen were free to take part of the wish. Typical Mulroney compromise. Well, I think that one of the things the negotiators should, and I would think will agree to right at the beginning, is that we are talking about trade policy. We're talking about tariffs, and we're talking about non-tariff barriers. And this is not to be linked with our political position related to Star Wars, related with trade with Cuba, with what we think about Nicaragua. And I think right at the beginning, those things will be and should remove from the table. And, and I hope they will. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, even though you open up uh, free trade with the US, being that the traditional industries in the US are under fire from foreign competition, how is that going to help Canada where we ourselves are under? the same problem with foreign competition with our traditional industries. You take the coal industry where the, the main uh, um, person you sell to is Japan. I don't know how that's, you know, the steel industry going down in the States uh, as well as Japan. How is that going to help with uh, more open trade towards the States when you still have this problem? Sure. First, in terms of traditional industries, most people there think of uh, industries like clothing and textiles and footwear which are under intense competitive pressure in both countries from producers around the Pacific Rim. What we see as an advantage of a bilateral trade agreement is that you're going to open up the North American market to producers in both countries and they can specialize. They can move up market. They can develop that uh, this type of footwear, that high fashion garment that's going to sell in the North American market. and It'll actually improve their ability to compete with offshore producers. But there will be some industries uh, that will probably suffer. Oh, yes. Probably see the death of. I, well, I've, um, people who've looked into it find it hard to point to industries that we would actually see the death of. Yes. Some contracting somewhat, some expanding somewhat. But I know you're not doing it, but so often people think about what would happen if we had free trade with the whole world. Well, if we were talking about free trade with the NICS tomorrow, the newly industrializing countries, the adjustments would be enormous and horrendous. We're not talking about that. We're talking about competing with a country roughly similar than us, to us. And the evidence, what happened in Europe and what's happened in the past in Canada, is you don't lose whole industries. Almost never do you lose a whole industry. What happens is is within an industry you specialize and if you go to Europe you see 
fashion goods being produced in every European country and being traded in every European country. And it's that kind of uh, specialization that one will find. A whole industry is awfully hard to locate that you think would go. Uh, you used a new word there. We better get used to it. Uh, nix. Oh, sorry. <laughs> What's a nix? <laughs> we, uh, we, yeah, well, jargon. Uh, it's just short for newly industrializing countries. The newly industrializing countries who are bursting onto the trading scene. Korea. Korea. Yes. Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, and of course the joker in the pack down the line is China, just beginning to burst under the system. And these are pressures that are going to impact on the Canadian economy anyway. And the best way to get a healthier Canadian economy that can adjust to those pressures is that we have secure access to a big market in which we have rationalized production. And then we can at least start competing with the Americans yeah. in all fields of endeavor. Absolutely. After the break. More calls. You've got some special function on today in Vancouver. Yes, the Canadian American Committee is meeting today in Vancouver. It's a group of private sector leaders drawn from both countries. Uh, with, uh, earlier this month, the committee released a policy statement on Canadian U.S. trade options, and the committee uh, supports this negotiating process, which we have now embarked on with Prime Minister Mulroney's announcement yesterday. You're having a fancy lunch today at the Bayshore. Yes, we're having a luncheon today. Premier Bennett is addressing the committee, and then we're going to have working sessions that will discuss some of the key issues that are likely to arise in negotiations. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Uh, Jack, I'm a retired, or this is for your guests. I'm a retired pensioner that like to spend some of my winters or a part of my winters as much as I can afford in the United States. But, you know, I just recently came back and I've been listening to all this free trade business and I think it's a joke. Jack, you know, we've done almost everything. We've pussied up to the, to the Europeans. and We've gotten the metric system. The BC wasn't for sale. Uh, we've got too much oil and gas. We want to be independent. All this kind of garbage. We devalued our dollar by 40%. Now we're talking about free trade. Perhaps maybe I can ask your guess. You know, if it's free trade, do we go back to, is our money go back to par and we start over free, or do we still want the edge on top of everybody else? You know, this business about losing our sovereignty is a joke. You know, we've gone every way. Our Americans are our only traders. We use the same language, we use the same money. The next thing I know, we're going to be using yen pretty soon. We've tried everything. You know, BC wasn't for sale. Jack, I'd like to ask you, uh, your, your, your guess something. If this free trade, does that mean our dollar is worth up equivalent to the American dollar? Or does this go back to where we start out at 30 cents and then we want it free? Why do we always want the edge? Okay. Well, the, the dollar will continue to be de determined on a, on a free market. There's no, there will be no agreement to manipulate the dollar. I think we push our dollar down, don't we? We push it down deliberately. Uh. We push it down so we can have the edge. That's not free. That's <laughs> not even being fair. Well, we are certainly slightly undervalued against the U.S. dollar Maybe. now. That's to do with what's going on in the U.S. Uh, probably 80 cents is... Probably 78, 80 cents. cents is about right, but certainly never back to dollar like it used to be and be honest. Well, go back to the 1970s and tell your government not to inflate the prices in Canada uh, faster than the Americans. We had no, an inflation I'll tell you faster something. than the, the Americans. The only way that Canada could probably ever come out of the doldrums that if the Egyptians have the power to, to, put, the, to put the kibosh on the oil again, boy, did we ever enjoy that. Look what it did to us. <laughs> Do you want to know something, my friend? If we rechristened the dollar the beaver, we'd be a lot happier. And then we wouldn't worry about whether one beaver was worth one U.S. dollar. It's the calling them the same name that causes you the trouble. You know what we would pay? Now, I haven't been able to figure out, and you people are over the C.D. Howe Institute, and I'd like to know this. What would we pay in dollars and cents to a Canadian gallon for our gasoline? I use pr premium unleaded gas. What would we pay instead of the metric system? What would we pay per dollar that the Americans will understand? How much is it a gallon today? I'm not sure what your question is. Are you talking about the price of the pump right now? Now, what are we or paying you... now to the price of the pump? I we'll know what I paid across the line. 50 cents uh, a liter, 54 what cents do you mean a 50 liter. Cents, 50. Jack, 58 cents. 55 cents a liter. I'm paying 58 Four, five cents to Jack, today. 43 dollars a gallon. 3 dollars a gallon. That's got to be a joke. Hasn't it? 
Well, I went across the United States the other day. I paid a dollar thirteen a gallon. Forget about our depreciation, our devaluation, and our metric system. It's a joke. Okay, the government is swallowing all our cash. Go and have a good laugh, but it's, it is a fact, you know. We're paying well over two fifty a gallon for gasoline. But prices have a lot to do with taxes that are quite independent with free trade. This Can we afford a... to collect all these taxes still? Can we afford our social safety network? Yeah, but this well, is Donald yeah. says we can. But these are domestic policies that are quite independent of free trade. I'm quite critical of some of our tax and domestic policies. If we go to free trade with the United States, will we have to drop our social security system to match theirs? Absolutely not. That's, that's a, a myth that people have. There's no reason why we should. Let me go back to just what Murray said. Look at Sweden. Sweden is the most, quote, socialistic country in the Western world. They have a free trade association with Europe. They haven't had to change their policies. They work harder than we do, though. <laughs> They're more efficient than we do. They look after the forests better. They They've got four times as many people working in half the size of forests and that's why they have better trees, better markets. Oh, in many ways they're a model economy, but we don't have to change our underlying social policy. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. Yeah. Uh, you know, the gentleman just hit it on the head when he when he pointed to the system in Sweden. I mean, uh, this, this free trade, uh, it, it may help in the long run, but uh, it's not going to be a panacea. I mean, yeah. these countries yeah. in Northern Absolutely. Europe have for decades have had uh, socialist, pl scientifically planned economies. When Canada is left up to the, uh, the development of Canada is left to the whims of uh, opportunist capitalists, uh, I mean, you can't expect uh, free trade to solve all our problems. Let me put that to Dr. Lipsy. A, a strategically planned economy controlled by the government would give us a much better crack of the whip for jobs and the economy, wouldn't it? Instead of leaving it to these incompetent, wasteful, industrialists who have not kept in step with the rest of the world. Well, all I can say in answer to that is go and talk to the mandarins in Ottawa who have tried for 20 years. I don't know a mandarin in Ottawa anymore who has confidence that the government can run the economy better than, than business can, the business part of it. Uh, it just, just isn't so. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say one other thing. There's a lot of talk that said the McDonald Commission had sold out to the interest of private industry. Well, look, <coughs> there is no class struggle going on over this between labor and capital, we're talking about a healthy economy. There can be no jobs with the future unless business is prosperous. So business and labor are in this boat together. And a prosperous business that can sell its product is critical not only to profit takers, but it's critical to labor. And we're looking for what will make our business healthier. A uh, pro prosperous business is, is, is necessary, but it can't be, I mean, we, we can't uh, let the situation be that unless the business, the profit margin is, is, is enough for yeah. them to come into the country rather than invest somewhere else, we can't leave it up to that idle whim. I mean, maybe they're doing better in, uh, like some of the American companies pull out and, and invest in the Philippines or something and jobs are lost in the States. Well, I mean, those kinds of things uh, okay. happen all the time. Probably people take a look at Canada and think, oh, well, go somewhere else. Yeah. Then Hold they, on. The question was so rich, I, we missed some parts of it. I just do want to say I agree with you, it's no panacea. It's crazy to think that one cure is a panacea. If uh, your doctor cures you of pneumonia, that won't stop you having a game leg. F free trade is one possible help to an ailing economy, and it's only one, and it's not the panacea. We All agree. I know is that something <laughs> must be done, and the da danger in this country today is the disparity again between the East and the West. 8% unemployed, prosperity in Ontario, 14.3 here, and a great fear about the future without any inspiration from any government, provincial or federal, in this benighted country. One other point the, the caller just made was this question of investment. And that's going to be a critical element in creating jobs in Canada. What we face now is that with this protectionist climate in the United States, even if measures are not actually imposed, simply the threat of those measures creates an incentive for both foreign firms and Canadian firms to invest in the United States rather than Canada. Much bad. Mm. We've got to leave it there. Richard Lipsy and Murray Smith from the C.D. Howe Institute. We're on the way towards free trade. Moroni just kind of kicked the first ball off in the House of Commons yesterday and today. We'll see what happens. Uh, am I going to use Jerry Rubin or not? Yes. Eh? Yes, what, how do we vote in the staff? Yeah. After the break. Oh. I'm going to 
use a Jerry Rubin interview. In fact, I think I'll dedicate this to journalism students on how not to conduct an interview. To be too hostile is silly. But this is a famous yippity yappy fellow who was in town last week. Jerry Rubin. He can best be described as a traitor to his class and his cause. I interviewed him in the 60s, and what a disgusting creature he was. We started the interview with me accusing him of being on dope. He came back at me and said, you, and his eyes were glassy, you've been drinking. Now, who is he? Well, there he is. He is one of the original anarchists from the Vietnam War protest movement. He did everything. He was a guy who laid on the train tracks to stop the war. He was, I say, a big dope user. He was involved in the march in the Pentagon in 67. He was a great buddy of his now enemy, Abby Hoffman. He was one of the Chicago Seven. He wrote a book called Do It, in which he advised you to kill your ma and pa. He ripped up the draft cards and at one time uh, rained dollar bills on the American Stock Exchange in New York. And what is he now? Ladies and gentlemen, from yippee to yappy, <laughs> Jerry Rubin, a faded looking 47 or 48 years old who has dropped any principles he ever had and is now in it for a buck. Do you still drink? No. Good. Do you still do dope? My, no. Hey, you don't do dope? No, no, you never did dope. Drink. No, I never did when dope, did you stop I drinking? don't do drink. I when stopped drinking you? two years ago. When did you stop very, dope? Very, very, about it. You and I have gone through a very similar health thing, but you smoke cigarettes. No, you smoke, I do cigarettes. smoke cigarettes. That is a very bad thing. That's almost as bad as alcohol. It's probably worse than alcohol. I see. So I really feel the cigarettes have, has hurt you. But tell me, what about being a traitor to your cause in your class? What are you now but nothing but a bland, button down shirted huckster for the American way of life in all its worst forms? Is that a question? No, it's a statement to which you can respond. Because you're a feisty interviewer and you can always keep the interviewer under control. Well, okay. okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> How much money you Where do I begin? How much money you Not enough. How much have you All the a... value I've created, I should have a lot more money. Why did you drop your decent good principles? Because you did some good things. You helped to end the Vietnam War. Not the description you gave me a minute ago. That was very hostile. It wasn't hostile. It was accurate. Okay. okay anyway. Was it inaccurate? It was inaccurate. Tell me when it was inaccurate. Oh, it was from beginning to end, it was inaccurate. None of it was true. It had an element of truth. You did help organize the march on Washington. Yeah. And the Pentagon. Yeah. And you marched against the American military installations. Very good. And you were an anarchist. Yeah. You that's were. True. I was an anarchist. But it was yeah. I wrong? Yeah. 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 Now, what made you cross the Rubicon? from social conscience to opportunism. <laughs> Loaded question. Phil Donahue, you're not. No, I'm different from Donahue. Yeah. OK, uh, basically, I think that I'm no different than the millions of people that were active in the 60s. Um, in the 60s, we saw the society as one that we could change from the outside. We thought that by rebellion and protest and demonstrations that we could create a, a, a new uh, America, a new Western civilization, create a new example for people. I think we accomplished a tremendous amount. But society uh, ha did change. The United States did get out of Vietnam. Watergate took place. And I think that basically the generation of the 60s uh, has decided that it can now change America from the inside, inside the corporations, entrepreneurially, by creating a, a new value system. And that's done not as dramatically it's not done with picket signs. It's done through constructive uh, activities in, in many different ways. Good. So I think that the changes of the 60s, the positive changes of the 60s, are going to be implemented in the 90s by the same generation of people called the baby boom generation. And I think that I uh, have gone through the same changes that many people have gone through. Well, and you've changed a lot more than I have. I still have a social conscience. Good. Do you? Well, sure, absolutely. Are you a Republican? Mm -hmm. What are you? I would guess I would call myself kind of a new kind of Democrat. Um, I think the word used in America, though I hate labels, is neoliberal. In other words, I'm trying to create a new kind of poli a kind of a new kind, a new of, kind of sensible, decent liberal. A, a new kind of politics. Like a, like a right-wing socialist party, one with a conscience. No, I don't think I'm a socialist or a right-winger, so it's not a right-wing socialist party. You were a great admirer of Fidel at one time. Now, there's a good socialist. Yeah. I, I admired, um, at that time, um, people that stood up for themselves and um, 
organize their country in opposition to being controlled by another country. Sure, like Mao Zedong. Yeah. So, uh, but unfortunately, I think that the evolution that took place in Cuba has not been a positive evolution in terms of incorporating a lot of the democratic values that I also believe in. So I, I'm in favor of uh, self-determination, but I'm also in, I also think that there's a lot of values in the United States that uh, should be included along with self-determination. Anyway. So I think that a lot of the, the disillusioning process that many people went through from the 60s came because, look at the changes in the world. Uh, what happened if the United States got out of Vietnam, uh, the, the, the murders in Cambodia. A lot of those things changed our minds, and it's a much more complicated world. You see, you, you, Do you think you, it's any better now than it was in the 60s when you've got the Americans with the uh, Star Wars, with the continual threats, with the trouble with their allies? Don't you think we're much nearer a nuclear holocaust than we were in the 60s? Not really. Uh, well, I think we're always near a nuclear holocaust. As long as the weapons exist, we're near a nuclear would holocaust. Would you agree that the leadership we get from the United States is somewhat pathetic? Yeah, but I wouldn't call it from the United States, because I think the people of the United States also don't like that leadership. From the uh, government uh, of the United States. From the government of the United States, yeah. Do you think uh, a, uh, a movie actor like Reagan is a guy who should be running the United States? I'm totally States? opposed to Reagan. Totally. Yeah, totally opposed to Reagan. Well, so he's no, something. We agree on that. He's, uh, he's a disaster, yeah, isn't he's he? He's a disaster, and I think that his politics will be repudiated in the next election, and I think what's going to happen is you're going to see that the baby boom generation, mm -hmm. the generation of the 60s, that was the rebellious generation of the 60s, that in the 70s went into personal fitness, uh, male-female awareness and consciousness, and it's creating a new model of I, I, a new lifestyle in this country is going to also create a new politics. In a sense, the baby boom generation has had a tremendous impact <coughs> on the culture of the country, on the economics of the country, but not yet on the politics, and that is to come. That's one of the great weaknesses of the United States, isn't it? You had Townsend at one time. He's before your time. You remember his Townsend. Oh, yeah, yeah. You had Townsend. But you've never developed a socially conscious reasonable party of the left, as in Europe or even in Canada, have you? Well, I don't think this party of the left is in power in Canada, is it? No, but we've got strong parties of the left and yeah, the left. Yeah. I mean, well, for instance, we well, have a so, decent... Well, what is the left? The left are people who cho choose to care for their fellow inhabitants. Oh, and every, everybody says they care. I mean, what is the left? Well, I'll I mean, tell you what the left has done in Canada. I'll tell you what it's done in Canada. It gave us a thoroughly admirable mm -hmm. Medicare system and doctor care, which you have not got in the United States. Are you for looking after poor people, or are you for your charity medical system? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely for looking after poor people. You are. Mm -hmm. And you give them a medical care plan, such as we have, if you could. I'm not that familiar with your medical care program. But well, you uh, have to buy blood in the States, don't you? Mm -hmm. But uh, isn't Canada... Shot your networking technique. Mm. Sponsored by the American Marketing Association. Like the Moonies come up and get the uh, disciples and all the American cults. Oh, disciples, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. No, I've created a um, form of people meeting each other that has created a tremendous um, response in the United States. Jerry, I'm going to give you a chance to explain it to yeah. me properly okay. after the break. Okay. Remember the box. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was trying to get you going, and you didn't really respond until you began to get after me on the colony. I wanted to demonstrate how you have changed. You admit you have changed, right? How am I Anybody going? Anybody who stays the same from day to day or decade to decade is uh, not somebody very interesting. Right. I, I think that I have changed just like uh, the country's changed and millions of people have changed, and probably many of the viewers out there have changed. You haven't changed, though. No. No. I'm still a fighter for social progress and try to prick phony balloons. Not that you are. You're also a great self-promoter. You're telling me how great you are. No, great the country is, see, see, not see, me. See, you have an advantage here in that you have a whole bio of me, and you know... A handout. And you know all about me, and I know nothing about you. But, uh, but all you've... I know about you is, is it says all I know here. about you is that in a short discussion you've thrown out more cliches, more prejudice, right. m more uh, you're not in touch with your own anger, right. and and this is not a discussion. It's it's it's, shout, it's throwing uh, words and and at each other. It's ridiculous. You're not Phil Donahue. No, I know I'm not. And you got to give up, and you, and you, and you gotta give up cigarette smoking. And there's I don't intend change, to be Phil Donahue. There's one change I can have on your life, Jack. That's to give up cigarette smoking. Give up smoking. cigarette smoking. Good. It's destroying your bloodstream. It's going to shorten your life. And it's a, and, and you cannot talk about being for social change when you're putting poison into your body. You, Jack well, Webster. You certainly learned the hard way about putting poison into your body, so didn't you? So listen to me. When did you give no. up dope? 
<laughs> what are you going to give up cigarette smoking? Quite seriously, American Marketing Association from yippee to yuppie. Youth International Party to Young Upward Professional. Mm. Did you invent that term? No, the term was invented by a journalist describing the activities I was putting on. I was putting on... Give me a free sample of your lecture on networking. Tell me well, about it. Well, basically, um, every Tuesday in New York City, I put on the biggest party in New York. And uh, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s come, uh, mainly business people. Uh, they come bring business cards. And they come into an environment where uh, people meet one another. Uh, many businesses have been started. Uh, people find financing for the businesses. We're witnessing an entrepreneurial boom. People want to be on their own these days. They don't want to be prisoners to a corporation. They want to be independent. And uh, there's a whole new search for creating new kinds of corporations. And so I've created an environment where business and social interact and mix. It kind and of get them all to meet so they can do business with each other, yeah, and, and it's, it's take actually, in each other's it, it, washing. It, it's actually because of the fact that women are now independent economically and, and, and are creating their own economic futures that men and women can can meet as equals as economic producers. All right, let me so the event that I create takes place in a in a club in New York called Palladium. If anyone in, in Canada is going to be in New York who's a business person on a Tuesday, they can come to Palladium and, and experience this. And it's gotten a lot of attention. And, and what happened is when I was doing it a couple of years ago, a journalist was writing a story. And since I was one of the creators of the word yippee, he um, wrote an article saying that Jerry Rubens wants to become a leader of the yuppies and young, upwardly mobile professionals. Well, that's this, an accurate translation. Was, well, this was the first time the word was ever used, mm -hmm. the, word, the word yuppie. And um, uh, that's, that's what gave birth to the word. Uh, you were involved in venture capital. How do you, reckon, how do you make money now? Buy these lectures, or are you in, uh, in business for yourself? I have my own business. What do you sell? Uh, I have my own business. I basically am an event producer. So I, I put on these networking events, and people pay a fee to get into the club, and so I get a percentage of that. So that's my, so my business is basically the business of introducing people. I'm, 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 also, I'm also kind of a, of a, uh, a, a kind of a, a marriage broker between business people. Business evangelist in some ways. Well, I'm certainly an, an evangelist for people uh, taking risks and, and going into business for themselves and having the adventure of business and combining their, their idealism with business reality. But you are still showing some political consciousness because you are a neo-small L liberal, is yeah. that right? Yeah, well, I say it. That, that word probably describes what I believe, but it's not that I follow that precepts. In other words, I'm not a follower, but I think that what I believe is very close to... How to do that. you feel in your little friendly debates with your old cohort, uh, Abby Hoffman? I believe you put on debates from time to time yeah. across yeah. the United States. Well, it's an, it's an interesting debate because I think that we symbolize the conflict that goes on inside many people today, and that is that to be practical, that people need money to live, and, and, and kind of the, the yuppie lifestyle is appealing. At the same time, some of the questions you're raising, uh, is there still a social conscience, and how do you combine a social conscience with being a business person? It, it was easy, in, in a sense, it was easy in the 60s, because all you had to do was say, I'm a rebel and I reject the system, and people, f we were kind of living in a, soci in a society at that point that we thought was totally affluent. We were living kind of off the garbage of society. Now people realize it's hard to make money, and it's a struggle out there. So the conflict between Abby and I that is symbolized on that stage by our, our, our two ways of life is, is a conflict that's going on inside many people today. But even as a neoliberal, your life is dedicated to the entrepreneurial free enterprise system where each man stands on his own feet and the devil take the hindmost? No, no. Uh, I'm certainly not against everyone being an employee of the government, if that's the alternative. You're against that? I'm against that. So am yeah, I. Good. Would agree. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, I, I feel that um, the government has to be an arbiter and keep the game um, honest between people and give everyone a fair chance and I'm for using resources to, to eliminate poverty by helping poor people survive economically. So it's, it's a real challenge today to figure out how to combine a free market economics with a social challenge, a social conscience. And I think this question that you're raising is probably the question that is most alive in the baby boom generation that had one solution in the 60s and the 80s has become practical business people and now wants to combine their ideals with reality. But Jerry, going back that 20 years, don't you miss the fun? Oh, I had fun in the 60s. I'm having fun in the 80s. I have fun every day. Uh, Jerry Rubin, uh, you're, are you a creature of the American Marketing Association? No. They sponsor your visits. Yes. Yeah. And he comes up to the colony of Canada and charges 20 bucks a head to hear him talk. It's not worth the money. Don't ever go. And don't phone the number in New York.
Next day, Schneider goes down to find, goes around town to see if he can find any nostalgia about that era after the break. <laughs> Sent Mark Schneider out to chat up some of our old, uh, I suppose you could call hippies of the 60s, to see if they've changed as much as Ruben has changed. And I think we're going to meet Ho Chi Minh Harcourt too, among this particular group. In 1968, activist Stan Persky did his thing by being arrested for loitering. He spent three days in jail and became an instant prison martyr, and famous across Canada in this McLean's Feature Magazine article, he now writes and teaches political science. Um, there were a lot of kids uh, in Vancouver from Quebec who were sitting on the steps of the courthouse, and people didn't want them sitting on the steps, and the police were going to arrest them. So I was a student leader. I went down there because I knew people were going to get arrested. And since I had a lawyer and they didn't, it seemed like it was a lot easier for me to do it. When's the last time you've been arrested? 1968. So you haven't gotten into being arrested since then. What's changed over the years for you? Um, in 1968, I was a moderate leftist student radical when Jerry Rubin was running around our campus. And now, in 1985, I'm a moderate leftist adult radical trying to get rid of the Socred government in British Columbia. You had more hair then. That's true. There was more hair everywhere, especially on the pages of the Georgia Grape, which split away from the old Georgia Strait when it became too straight for some, like Steve Garrett, who edited the grape. For him, the issues are now the same, the hair is just shorter. You were famous back then, weren't you? Moderately. Moderately famous. Yes. You I, insulted the queen. Well, not her directly, uh, although some people think so. I claimed to insult her daughter when I had an opportunity to eat dinner on the Royal Yacht in May of 1970, and we had a little parade. Well, tell me, why would a person like you at that time be even invited into the presence of the queen? Well, I was the president of the student council at UBC, and We'd won an election on kind of a progressive platform, and they accidentally sent me an invitation. Back in the 60s, rock promoter Bruce Allen wore tight pants, raced cars, and held hands with high schooler Jeannie Reed. To him, the 60s meant more music and more money. Do you miss, do you miss those days? Anything about it? The hippies I'm, out in the streets rioting? I don't miss that so much. I don't miss the civil disobedience, as, as they called it. Um, I miss the characters. I think Joaquin Focus and uh, and Tom Campbell and uh, and the different sides that we you know I miss I miss when the Georgia Strait now is just an advertising rag before then it was a real political newspaper and I really I really miss the confrontation that those days always always had I I miss the police riding up and down the streets you know and the kids running and, and the bee-ins and all that kind of stuff you miss that because they were, they were, people were really aware then I don't think we we're aware half as much as, as we are as we were then. But Terry David Mulligan developed an identity crisis in the 60s. He didn't know whether grass was to cut or smoke. He's joined the 80s as a VJ, the TV equivalent of a disc jockey. So what kind of um, weirdo were you in the 60s? I, in fact, wasn't near as weird. I'm probably one of these straighter um, long hairs from the 60s. Uh, straight long hair. The thing was, I, when I moved on to 4th Avenue in Vancouver, I had long hair and I was a radio announcer. But what preceded me was the fact that I had been at one time a Mountie for four years. and so. They felt that... Nobody would smoke dope with you. <clears throat> That's right. And, and they felt that uh, I was undercover, working undercover. Well, here we are, 1985. This is the longest undercover gig I have ever seen. Finally, this character, graduate of the leftist UBC Law School, defender of the working class and champion of downtrodden hippies everywhere, a shadowy man they called Ho Chi Harcourt. Were you ever arrested? No, but I, I had two presentations to the Law Society suggesting that I be disciplined or disbarred. For that, an involvement with Kool-Aid, of course, and the Inner City Project, and all the uh, citizens' activism that was going on in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, Actually, I, I didn't come as close to getting arrested as Art Phillips did and Ed Sweeney in the Gastown riots. And Bald is Beautiful, your next re-election slogan, is that right? Well, I've, that's been the implicit message through the first three. A lot has changed since those crazy days of the 60s. For one thing, look at Gastown. I mean, it's become positively sedate since this place was just diffused with rioting. A lot of the people are gone, too. I tried to find Dan McLeod, the publisher of Georgia Strait Magazine. The secretary tells me he's off on a bit of a European vacation. I did find one fellow, though, from the 60s, a person who went away to escape the nasty turmoil of those days. 
Now he's come back. You may recognize him. He works for you, Jack. That's Schneider. That's great. I have some memories of the 60s, too, by the way. Uh, time for a few phone calls after the break. I was at the heart of the Gastown riots in Gastown, where I was broadcasting from, and my friend Wasserman uh, called the riots at that time, led and instigated by a bunch of idiots. Uh, used to call it the Tom Campbell Jack Webster Memorial Gastown Riots. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'd like to uh, know why you're not on the evening anymore. I, I don't always get to catch you in the morning, and I used to catch you in the evening. You miss the rebroadcast and check, do you? Yeah. Uh, and I miss Shirley MacLaine. I was so disappointed. Well, that's the bad thing about no rebroadcast, but that was a decision made. Um, uh, that's all I can say, really. Yeah. Well, I, I hope that they uh, change their minds on that because, uh, you know, I don't always get to catch you in the morning, and I really enjoyed seeing you in the evening. When you miss Shirley MacLaine, you miss, you miss the best showbiz interview I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> but we'll play it again several times, I'm sure, at Christmas time. Next spring, it's on syndication. You'll see it on Sunday. December 15, who said that? 16th. Dis get the date right. <laughs> December 16, it'll be on. Is that a Sunday? Monday. A Monday. Why is it on? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Monday, December 16th, the first of the Christmas reruns. It is priceless. I'll mark it down in my calendar. Thank you for your call, love. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes, yes. Yeah, hey Jack, you know, yesterday when you were showing those latchkey kids, yeah, you know, I don't think that was a good idea, you showing those kids pictures. Well, no. Oh, I'm a concerned grandmother. There were, and the, there were no names. Those going round? It was a little bit, perhaps, but no names, no schools, no nothing. I don't think it could cause the slightest problem. But I appreciate your concern. I had to make a quick decision. Maybe I made the wrong one, but I, I don't feel badly about it. Okay, Jack. Thanks, love. I had to make a quick decision. Alberni. Hello, Jack. How are you this morning? The salmon capital of the world. Yeah, terrific. Hey, Jack, we just came back from a trip uh, from Oregon. Yeah. And upon coming back into the city of Vancouver, my girlfriend and I couldn't help but notice the lack of proper traffic signs to get people over to the island or uh, to send them anywhere near the Lionsgate Bridge. Another, it was just horrible. Another day I look at it. I've only got a few minutes. Can't tackle it now. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack. Hello? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, wondering what, why the gas uh, prices vary so much in the interior of the, of the province so much. Like well, the easy way is just to say it's the cost of the oil company. I think it's scandalous. I think it's terrible. There's not a damn thing we can do about it now. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I, I, I remember Jerry Rubin quite well when he came to the University of British Columbia and made a good speech and... Uh, uh, picked up a pig and uh, took over the uh, faculty club there. Yeah, I remember the pig in the faculty club. He certainly has changed. He's now dull, banal, defensive, <laughs> salesman of the simplest possible American way of life. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, uh, I would have liked to see you ask those two Tories about uh, when they thought we might become a third world country with this free trade issue. Uh, um, I've seen some underlying comments from them about more competitive prices and what this does is... That's true, but there's more danger of becoming a third world country if we don't do something. We're being squeezed out of world markets because of the lack of political leadership in this country, and maybe we'll have to go at least part of the way to try and do something. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. I was wondering if you're aware of the more, uh, more postal cutbacks that are coming up? Postal cutbacks in service. No, I hear something about the sub-post offices being under the hammer and under the gun. I haven't heard about any services yet, but if you'd like to call after the program, I'll get somebody to talk to you, and I'll be back after the break. <clears throat> Dr. Sakala, the famous American doctor who put the baboon heart and little baby Faye is going to be here Monday. Should be interesting. We're also going to do a detailed piece with demonstrations of sexual harassment in the workplace. <laughs> Seriously. 
We're going to have Reva Dexter and Andy Danny Lou. Sexual harassment. I can't think of a sample I could do on there. But nah, I can't. Monday, 9 a.m. precisely. Where did you so I can cut him off? What an arrogant young whippersnapper upstart. I love my program too. <laughs> Nobody knows what my politics are because I don't know what my politics are except that I'm against the government. On principle, on all occasions. Put the camera Roster. up a little bit, you're making me look fat again. Um, Mr. Up. Roaster, I'd like your opinion. Up, come on. And drunk Put it driving. Up. Um, That's much better. Look at me now. And and this is not a discussion. It's 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 shout. It's throwing uh, words and and at each other. It's ridiculous. You're not Phil Donahue.